So good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the next lecture in our Turing Lecture Series. Um, I'm very excited today to welcome Ben Schneiderman uh, from the University of Maryland, who will be telling us a bit about algorithmic accountability. Um, and also let me welcome you to the British Library um, and the Alan Turing Institute. Um, so we've had many lectures in the, uh, in the Turing uh, Lecture Series on different themes relating to key ideas um, and practices in data science. Um, so for example, our most recent lecture was on the use of machine learning um, in medicine. And today's lecture is going to pick up on one of the key research themes uh, in, or one of the key research themes of the Institute, which is data ethics. Um, algorithmic accountability is an extremely important topic uh, within data ethics, and we're very excited that Ben is going to, to tell us a bit about it. Um, so I'm very happy to, to introduce Ben. As I mentioned, he's from the University of Maryland. Um, he's a distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science. Um, he's an expert in human-computer interaction, user interface design, information visualization, and social media. Uh, he is also the founding director of the Human-Computer Interaction Laboratory and a member of the UM Institute for Advanced Computer Studies again at the University of Maryland. Uh, ben is the lead author of Designing the User Interface Strategies for Effective Human-Computer Interaction, now in its sixth edition. Uh, ben is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Association for Computing, the IEEE, and the National Academy of Inventors and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering in recognition of his pioneering contributions to human-computer interaction and information visualization. His key contributions include the direct manipulation concept, clickable highlighted web links, touchscreen keyboards, dynamic query sliders, development of tree maps, and countless others. I'm sure he will tell us about uh, the, the relevance of many of them to algorithmic accountability, uh, algorithmic accountability today. So his talk today is going to address algorithmic accountability and how to design for safety. And it will be based on his very impressive background in human-computer interaction and data visualization, which is extremely relevant to ensuring that algorithms and algorithmic systems are accountable and safe. So Ben, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Great, thank you. Yes, okay, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here, and thanks for that kind introduction. I'm very happy to, uh, to be here at the British Library and talking about this really important topic. As Brent mentioned, my background is in traditional computer science, doing database and file design optimization techniques, but in my career, I've become, I like to say, 20% of an experimental psychologist in studying the way people use computers. And that's led to the formation of the now 34-year-old uh, uh, Human-Computer Interaction Lab at the University of Maryland, an interdisciplinary collaboration between computer science and the rapidly growing iSchool, and involves partners in many other disciplines, including the wonderfully titled Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, MYTH. Uh, if you visit our website, there are 800 uh, technical reports, 200 videos, 200 projects, and so on. So this visit here is part of a, a book tour for the recently published book, The New ABCs of Research from Oxford University Press. And it is, a, in a sense, a summary of the perspective of what research should be like. In my career, and in, I'm going to talk about some of those examples, the best results came when, I, when our group was working on a real problem with real practitioners, and we took a theoretical approach. And that led to the twin-win idea of publishing good papers that have theoretical foundations and producing a validated solution that's ready for dissemination. So that's the idea. I phrase it as ABCs, applied and basic combined. It's not a matter of choosing one or the other or doing one first and the other, but doing both gives you better results in, those, in, in both areas. It also puts out what I see a trajectory of my life. I was trained as a physicist on particle physics, worked at Brookhaven Laboratories doing research on particle physics. 
But I became an engineer and member of the National Academy of Engineering, and my book is called Designing the User Interface. And so those three different ways of looking at the world are, I think, equally important. It used to be that research was science, but engineering has become research. And now there's a growing movement to make design research. It's not just designing a poster or a nice gadget, but it's designing social systems, designing the world around us. And increasingly, that's a growing form of gaining new knowledge and of shaping the world. So that's the themes I've been working on, but the book Designing the User Interface goes back to 1986, and its sixth edition, uh, published last year, tells the story of how these theoretical framings and practical thinking and practical problems led to positive outcomes. Uh, I'm proud of some of these things. Uh, I chose this little segment from Wikipedia about the British Library. And you can see some highlighted words, National Library, United Kingdom, second largest library in the world. And those light blue were the colors we chose in 1984-5 in designing early hypertext systems on a single computer. And we produced the first electronic book that's in the US Library of Congress, Hypertext, um, uh, uh, hypertext on, hi on Hypertext. And uh, that idea was picked up, and Tim Berners-Lee in his Spring 89 Manifesto for the Web cited that work. And there's an idea that traveled really well. We had a real problem. We had a real customer in a museum. And we built a system, and that idea then was refined again and again. The idea of small touchscreen keyboards. We, at the time, in 1990, the recommendations were if you're going to do buttons on a touchscreen, it had to be one inch square. So we built a nine inch wide keyboard. And we built a 7-inch and a 5-inch and a 3-inch one. And that's what comes on your, your, your pocket devices here. It's made very prevalent. And the strategy was very simple. When you put your finger down, you got a cursor just above your finger. And it showed you where it was pointing at. And you could move it around back and forth. And then you activate on liftoff. And that liftoff strategy is still what's used on your your iPhones. And actually, if you hover, you'll find you get some extra choices of characters with uh, um, accents and so on. The photo tagging was another simple idea driven by the real needs. I have about 40,000 photos on my laptop. And I'm always looking for pictures of certain people. And the idea of dragging a name from a list, dropping it, and clicking it in place so you could name all the people was the work that we did in the early 2000s, for which I got a patent from, and which the University of Maryland sold. And uh, the paper on that is cited by 57 patents. So sometimes you can see the trajectory of where an idea goes and how it travels. Um, I'm also proud of the work we did about information visualization in designing new environments like Spotfire, which was a commercial success story from the 90s. Um, and then the tree map idea here showing 500 stocks in the US stock market. You can see the different industry groups, technology in the upper left, services, financial, consumer goods, and so on. The area indicates the market capitalization. So the biggies are Apple and Google and Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Exxon Mobil, Johnson & Johnson. The color indicates whether it's going up or down. So green is a good day. And it was a pretty good day for most stocks, with some exceptions. But if you train your eye and mind, you'll see on the lower right-hand corner, there's one sector, and it's the utility sector, which was down that day. And so being able to see a lot of data at once was very important. Being able to see the anomalies, the ones that stood out, the red dot in a green sector, what's that about? Or the green dot in a big red sector. We also worked on network visualization with the Node Excel project. Uh, which still continues. This one was a famous early example which showed the polarization of voting in the Senate uh, now more than about 15 years ago. The red Republicans were tightly woven together, the blue Democrats tightly woven together, two independents voting with the Democrats, and three Republican senators who could sometimes cross over. Could sometimes cross over. That's less true these days. Uh, but <laughs> the polarization diagram is still widely reproduced. And more recently, we've been working on electronic medical records to show patient histories. Here, we're looking at a few hundred patients and the sequence of treatments. Um, we've done up several hundred thousand patients. And so this began to lead us to dealing with ever larger sets of data. All of these often come from huge data sets. And so 
That brings me to the topic for today, and that's how I got here to be involved in studying how to build systems that enable users to look at ever-growing sets of data. And there are ever-growing sets from the web, from customer histories, from your mobile devices, from the growing Internet of Things, from social media. The vast amounts of data are really quite remarkable. So for the first time in history, much of what we do is online. And for the first time in history, we are beginning to have the tools to cope with this remarkable amount of data. Now, surprisingly, the story of big data, or data science, is often told in a negative way about the torrent, the flood, the deluge, the tsunami of data, and that we're drowning in data. This seems curious to me because I believe that data is wonderful. Data, the flow of data will irrigate our thinking and nurture the creative output for us to see the world in a better way, to understand the processes that influence us. So I'm here in a very positive way. I want to see big data. I want to see powerful technologies put to work to promote positive outcomes for people. Indeed, we have serious problems in our time of healthcare delivery, of energy sustainability, of environmental protection, of community safety, of cybersecurity, and of course, of keeping British Airways planes flying. Uh, all those things are really important, and we need much more effective ways of dealing with big data. And that has been noticed by many people. And I trace back in the US to the five-year-old White House press release, three pages, that described the new initiative on big data. And it closes with two powerful challenges. The first one may be most familiar to you, developing scalable algorithms for processing imperfect data in distributed data stores. I like that it said imperfect because the data I see is pretty imperfect, missing data, uh, uncertain data, contradictory data, incorrect data. The data in the world is still pretty messy and probably will remain so. So we need powerful tools for cleaning that up and putting them to work. Scalable is another good word. But I really like the second challenge. Creating effective human-computer interaction tools. Tools, tools, tools will be my word here for facilitating rapidly customizable visual reasoning for diverse missions. Okay, and this was a clear assertion of the importance of developing the technologies that will allow a user, a human operator, or a supervisor, a manager, a clinician, a researcher, people who look at not just their own data, but ever larger circles of data, that they can understand that the data quality is good, that, and that they, the processes of using it and understand why it happened. Now, Cause and effect is really difficult, OK? We won't go there. But to be able to look at the data and see the patterns, the clusters, the gaps, the outliers, the anomalies is really very powerful. And that's why I became such a fan of visualization, because it gave a clear message about what was in the data. Sure, statistical methods are our friends. Sure, statistical methods are scalable. Algorithmic models, deep learning, machine learning are very powerful remarkable tools. We want to build them, but we want to use them safely. And to my mind, doing machine learning or data mining without visualization should probably be made illegal, or it's at least dangerous to your health. And so we're going to look for the ways to ensure that the big data and data science methods would produce productive outcomes. Last year, the US, the White House, issued a further description of their data strategies. We're not going to go into this, but I did want to focus on one which is the support for research and development on trustworthiness, another favorite word of mine, of data and trustworthiness of the resulting knowledge for better decisions, for breakthrough discoveries, and confident action. That was nice. And in the section describing that, there was this very nice phrasing. They wanted to ensure to promote transparency, including tools, tools, tools that provide detailed audits to show the steps that led to a specific action. Now, I'm sure many in this room know the difficulty of providing that, which is why it's one of the research strategies. But it set out a very clear aspiration and a very clear goal 
of what was needed if we're going to make data, big data and data science a success story. Now, many people have pointed out the dangers. And the dangers of privacy and others are widely reported. My favorite story is Kathy O'Neill's book called Weapons of Math Destruction, cleverly, cleverly titled The Term of Our Times. And she goes through about a dozen examples that show there are real problems. The teacher, who is seen as an excellent teacher, was given a tough class, and then her performance scores tumbled, and she was fired. And we ask, why was I fired? No explanation is possible. It's an algorithm that did it. Okay? She tells the stories of those going for home mortgages who are denied and are not able, there's no recourse, no redress, no way to find out what's going on. She tells the people going to be, who want to be hired, who want to go to a certain university, and they're denied. And so one after another, in great detail, she catalogs the way these, these algorithmic approaches have gone bad. And she tells it with these three key notions. She talks about opacity, opacity, the opposite of transparency, that they're black boxes. You can't see into them, okay? That they're used at scale. She's most critical about the kind of algorithms I used everywhere, where there's no alternative algorithm, there's no competitive market. One algorithm dominates, one way of doing credit scores, one way of rating employees, okay? And that, she thinks, is really problematic and that it's used so widely. And then that damage occurs. A particularly potent story is about uh, criminals who are seeking parole and they're denied parole. And why are they denied parole? Can't tell you. It's an algorithm. Okay? So judges increasingly depend on these algorithmic approaches. Now, some would say that it's the training data that's bad. And sometimes it is the training data. Because if you have training data of the past when there were biases, okay, and you continue to use that data, you're likely to continue and propagate those biases. And Kathy O'Neill outlines very nicely about how to minimize or reduce the, the potential of these. But there's also dangers because the algorithms may be bad. The algorithms may have bias. The algorithms may have emergent biases that others have cataloged, that they weren't biased in the past, but because of the changing situation, they become biased. So she has a strong phrasing here. And she says, these algorithms slam doors in the face of millions of people, often to the f for the flimsiest of reasons and offer no appeal, they're unfair. I think it's even worse. I think that the algorithms can be biased, harmful, and even deadly. The work we do with medical systems and other life-critical systems of air traffic control, nuclear control rooms, et cetera, have real risks for harm. So we can be critical. I mean, I, I like the examples she, choose, she chooses. They are potent ones. Uh, but a lot of the discussion in the data science arena has to do with more lightweight examples. And I would like to see the, the algorithms community stepping up to deal with serious problems, OK? That's what the new ABC is about. If they would bring, come out of the laboratory and do more than just playing alpha go, playing go or finding cats in photos. And they work on real problems closer to practitioners out of the laboratory. There's a better chance that the algorithms designed would be stronger and more effective, OK? And so the working on life critical takes on a very different perspective. And so the game is up. The game is rising. We have to be much more concerned about these problems. I went back to my own book, the first edition in 1986, Designing User Interface, and there was, a, there was a section in there, and I titled it Balancing Automation and Human Control. And this was looking at the ways the language of the time talked about 10 levels of supervisory control. Some of you may know Tom Sheridan's description of these. And I was aligned with that, and I said balancing automation and human control. But by the sixth edition, I've gone to asserting more clearly that the goal here is to enhance human control while increasing automation. 
Now that may sound like a bit of a puzzle, uh, maybe a Zen koan of uh, something mystical about it, but I hope you'll leave this room with an understanding that that's a valid goal and something we should seek. And that the notion of what it means to be in control of an algorithm has to change. It's not a matter of one person sitting at a keyboard and, and doing their Facebook post. It's a matter of a control at many levels where you move up the chain and that those who have authority and the key word will be responsibility have adequate levels of control. We never had control of everything that we did, but we had an understanding. We had a predictable, comprehensible, and controllable environment. Those are the tools that succeeded. Those are the words that I want to instill in your thinking. Comprehensible, predictable, and controllable. If we can design algorithms, interfaces, which are comprehensible, predictable in their behavior, and controllable at the level of human discourse. We may not understand every detail of every line of code. We may not understand how the circuits actually operate, but we have a sense of comprehensible, predictable, and controllable. I'm not alone in saying this. The interface guidelines from Apple uh, tell the developers very clearly, people, not apps, are in control. That's the iOS recent guidelines, people not apps are in control. And then they say that the design, the effective design, should ensure that users have complete fine-grained control of their work. That's pretty strong. And I would say in most of the two million apps in the App Store, that's pretty well checked out. That comes through. I haven't checked them all, but most of the ones I see give me a sense of control and comprehensibility. However, there's a drift towards some algorithms which take control away. Facebook's news feed's an example. You no longer are certain what's going on. You don't have control over it. It's not predictable in its behavior. If I want to know what my daughters have written, I'm not sure I'm going to get all their posts. And so when you go to systems which have richer complexity, you have to adopt a new philosophy of design. When you're talking about driverless cars, when you're talking about lethal autonomous weapon systems, when you're talking about medical systems, then we need to assert that these principles are the right ones to assure the control of the operator. Okay? And the key word, the takeaway message from this talk is responsibility is the guide to clarifying the design of systems. Okay? That if you ensure that the operator or their managers above have responsibility, then you're doing better. But remember, the current designs don't have this feature. They're a deception. Many designs suggest that the computers are our partners, or they're intelligent or smart. We're collaborating. But no, it's not true, because the human operator has responsibility, but the machine does not. Okay, Machines have no responsibility. And in fact, the contracts for software still have clauses that say hold harmless, that even the designers and operators and managers will be held harmless, or the software is delivered as is. So we are now in a dangerous situation where some would say we have computers as our partners, but they're not partners because you cannot rely, they're not responsible. Okay? So we have to get past the 50-year the adolescence of a software field and move on to a place where responsibility is accepted, where the contracts change. For other kind of equipment from machinery and aircraft and other equipment, the manufacturers are responsible. Liability is covered. Okay? We still have this unusual problem that in the software field, hold harmless and as is are still the terms of contracts. Okay? So that's going to have to change. So how do we address responsibility? Well, the USACM and the European actually last week, last Friday, endorsed the original one. This statement of principles for algorithmic transparent accountability, we'll look at them in a little more detail, those seven. But I just want to show you it's just a two-page document. And we're going to go through the parts that matter here, suggesting that there is a way forward. Okay, I'm happy this has happened. 
but I'm not happy enough. Okay, and we're going to take a look more closely at this movement. The Royal Statistical Society has endorsed this, and we see a growing movement of European, um, uh, UK, and other uh, players who are seeing this as a way forward. So the first one says awareness. Owners, bu designers, builders, users, and other stakeholders should be aware of possible biases and harms. Yes, that's good. But I've highlighted should be to me is a rather vague phrase. How do they know when they are aware? Who checks that they are aware? What happens if they're not aware? What damages do they pay? Where are they responsible? Second. Access and redress, good principle. Regulators should adopt mechanisms that enable questioning and redress. Not easy to do, but still a, a, a worthwhile goal. And should is not enough of a statement for me to clarify that if I'm a designer or a developer or a regulator, I know when I've done an adequate job. Accountability, institutions should be held responsible. There's my favorite word, responsible even if it's not feasible to explain how the algorithms produce results. Actually, this one really troubles me. Even if it's not feasible to explain, well, if it's not feasible to explain, then you should throw it out. OK? It's that strong. OK? If you can't build a system in which explanations are possible, don't use it. It's too dangerous. Number four, explanations. System and Institutions that use algorithms and decision making are encouraged to produce explanations. Well, nice that they're encouraged, but do they have to do this? And how do they know if they've done an adequate job? I'm into a situation where people who work and produce valuable and life critical software should know they've done a good job and they've done what's up to the standards. Every other field of engineering has principles and guidelines, and we should have these things as well. Number five, data provenance. Algorithm builders should maintain a description. OK, should maintain a description of how the training data was collected. Where do they maintain it? Is it open for public view? Does it require a subpoena to get it? What's going on? What's the format of the way they record this information? Is it machine readable? We don't know. So there's a lot of work to be done. Again, I want to repeat, these are positive first steps. And maybe they open the door for many of you for your research projects to, to make these things more of a reality. Number six, auditability. Models, algorithms, data, and decisions should be recorded so that they can be audited. OK, what format are they recorded in? Where are they kept? Who has access to them? Who does the auditing? How is it done? As we're going to come to shortly, the, the example I like is the, the um, Aviation situation where flight data recorders are standardized. There's ways of collecting the data that are agreed across the industry. There are tools for analyzing it. So when an accident or failure occurs, you can find out what, happened, what went wrong. Finally, validation and testing. Institutions should use rigorous methods to validate their models. Yes, we all agree, but I think you, know, you got my story by now. What do you mean by should be uh, rig and, and what, it, what do we mean by rigorous? Okay. So I return to my inspirational phrase that I keep meditating on, ensuring human control while increasing automation. And I've already suggested there is different kinds of human control, not just the control of the person sitting in front of a screen or using an algorithm, but control at multiple levels of an organization, of a government, and so on. And here is the key point of this uh, uh, talk and my recent uh, essay in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that advocates for independent oversight. I became involved in studying independent oversight about 12 years ago as part of a National Academy's panel and looking for the ways for the Department of Homeland Security to protect privacy while fighting terrorism. Okay? And the ways and those sensitive issues, the methods that we described, all were based on notions of independent oversight. Now, just to clarify what I mean, independent oversight has been around for a long time. I think the most widely known are corporate internal audit committees and advisory boards. Those are internal, but the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US 
requires external audits. So companies like Ernst & Young, Deloitte, and so on provide an independent oversight and report an independent audit to provide feedback and make recommendations. Okay? That's why they use every um, you know, uh, open company in the US has to do that. University accreditation is another form of independent audit. Uh, National Science Foundation and EPSRC review boards, advisory boards, are ways that there's independent review of work that's proposed. Zoning boards, we're going to come to as an important, or planning commissions. If you want to build a building, you come to the zoning board and you say, or you want to make an office, you say, here's my plan. It's from an architect. It says what I'm going to do. It adheres to the building codes. It has the right strength of the structural members. It has egress for every point in the building, there are two, two ways of egress within 150 feet. Those are the kind of rules that are required. And then when you finish the building, the inspector comes along to check out that you've done what you said you're going to do and gives you a certificate of occupancy. Okay? Environmental impact statements are another version of independent oversight and various ones that I've studied through NASA, the Aviation Agency, Food and Drug Administration has independent oversight for pharmaceutical manufacturing, for meat packing, and so on. Federal Reserve for checking on banks. Now, these oversight methods are imperfect, but they provide a strong human-oriented way to get validation. Now, maybe the most important one is the National uh, Transportation Safety Board, which in the US is supported by Congress, but independent of any government agency. Independent of any government agency. It's not a regulator. Its sole job is to investigate accidents and make a report. And you can read those reports online of every aviation crash or train crash or other significant accident that occurred. And what I'm proposing is a National Algorithm Safety Board. Okay? Now, I don't think that you know, if you're a researcher and you're writing an algorithm for your project, that doesn't come under this. So you're welcome to do that, OK? It's not on the way of Kathy O'Neill's scale. It's not big. But if you're a major company and you're about to put out a major algorithm, or you're a bank and you're going to change the way credit is assigned, I think it's appropriate that you come before the National Algorithm Safety Board and that there's a review. And that says you've done this in a reasonable way so that customers can get explanations, that it's safe, that it's been checked, it's been validated, all those seven principles that we saw before. All right, and let me talk a little bit more about how this can happen. So there's three forms of independent oversight, and I think all three of them could be valuable. Planning oversight is very commonly used. Here's a planning board meeting in Lakewood, New Jersey. And a builder has come forward to propose building a new house. And the committee reviews and listens to this. And they are sure that it's, a, it's, been, uh, it's aligned with the current code of practices in, in the state of New Jersey. So planning oversights are a very common standard way. And it makes sense. If you're going to build something, you ought to be able to describe why it's going to be safe for the occupants and for the community. Okay. Second is continuous monitoring. This is a much more complicated, expensive one. And here, the Federal Reserve Board meeting. But the Federal Reserve also does continuous monitoring, uh, monitoring of, of banks to ensure they adhere to the practices, that the right amounts of, of collateral or reserves are kept, that the right customers are taken, that there's information about customers that is verifiable. Okay. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has observers at meatpacking institutions, and it has observers at pharmaceutical manufacturing. Continuous monitoring is expensive, but it is effective. It's imperfect. It doesn't get everything, but it's dramatically effective in reducing the, the violations of code and the harm to the public. And as you can see, this is put to work in places where large amounts of harm could be done, financial trading, High-speed algorithms are dangerous, OK? They cause trillion, hundreds of million, billions of dollars of drops in stock market values in minutes. Okay? The third kind is uh, what's most familiar for the National Transportation Safety Board. This crash of Asiana 214 at San Francisco Airport is it came short of the runway and hit 
Three people were killed, but most survived. And within hours, the investigators were on the scene seeing what happens. Now, retrospective analyses are very powerful. They're very interesting. And they do provide valuable records because they study when things go bad. And I just want to remind you that in software, things often go bad. Uh, Peter Newman, for 30 years, catalogs, you can look on his risks forum, thousands of cases where software went bad in one way or another. And now, as we move towards algorithmic approaches of, deep mind, uh, of, of machine learning and deep learning, we're going to see that there's risks of even greater harm coming from the, the use of algorithms. So this is a little summary. And this, we're getting close to what I, you know, I, want to, I want to register this in your mind, that planning oversight, which comes early, is a good way of getting things done, forces people to say in advance what we're going to do, OK? And changes the way that software is produced. Often in the software world, people say, well, we don't quite know what we're doing. We'll work it out, and we'll get it, we'll you know, clean it up later. And that kind of approach still is too adolescent for me in an era when we're talking about life-critical applications. The second is the continuous monitoring that while software is being used, there's continuous monitoring. And there would be software tools. The monitors would have rich, powerful tools, often visualization tools and user interfaces, to be able to do the continuous monitoring. And then the retrospective analysis of disasters. And the methods that the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, are a good model to build on for a National Algorithm Safety Board. As I studied these methods of independent oversight, a number of issues arose. What is the degree of independence that's necessary? You want the people who are these overseers and viewers to have enough knowledge of what they're studying that they can make effective recommendations. But you don't want them to be so close to the people doing the work that they become friendly and sympathetic. So for example, the Federal Reserve Board has rules about the overseers of banks have to rotate every few months because if they stay too long, they get too friendly with the people they're supposed to be taking, doing oversight. What kind of power do they have to subpoena information and people to get and to get information that's relevant to their questions. And then what powers do they have to enforce the recommendations? If it's just a report and no one has to act on it and there's no consequences for failing to act on it, we don't quite have the kind of strong independent oversight that I'm looking for. The methods of independent oversight, there's lots of good histories to build on. There's lots of lessons to learn. But there will be new challenges in applying these for algorithms. So I return again to my thought here. How do we ensure human control while increasing automation? We have examples, little ways, little examples. In your car, you have cruise control. And if you think of it, it's the word control. Cruise control lets you maintain the speed you want. When you turn a left turn signal, there's about 16 operations you invoke. You have better control over those. If you had to do them each individually, you wouldn't be able to be in control. And increasingly, the set of things you can do as a user is going up because the levels of automation we have are going up. Yeah. So we want to build on that. And I think the best way is through a formal process, but a social and adversarial process that would be embodied in something like the National Algorithm Safety Board. And so I close here by saying the goal is to clarify responsibility so as to accelerate quality. I think that's the key thing. If we focus on responsibility for failures, then we will see better how to design so that the human users and their managers and supervisors going up the chain can actually say they're responsible for the actions of the systems they use. There are a set of issues here, independent oversight, Open adversarial reviews. Transparency, open up the black box. Accountability, open failure reporting. That this is tough. We don't usually do this. Errors are often hidden and buried. But in many fields, we have a growing culture of safety. In the medical worlds that we've studied, some hospitals have what they call a culture of safety. When they have independent oversight, 
when they expose and discuss the errors they make, and when they make offers to patients who have been harmed, then actually the quality of work goes up, the number of malpractice suits goes down, and the number of errors goes down. Open reporting really does work. The FAA in the US and around the world, similar agencies are also models of excellence because we have essentially a very safe air transportation system because it's open. Any participant, there's a website where they can report mistakes they made. And the reporting of errors and near misses produces a culture of safety that is, I think, virtuous. Then the liability has to shift so that no hold harmless clauses are still around. Now we move towards, a, like most other fields, we produce quality goods that we as developers stand behind and which if citizens or users are harmed, there is recourse. They can receive compensation for those failures. It's a strong change for the software industry, but it's an important one and it gets us past our adolescence into a position of accepting responsibility. And that's my key takeaway message. Thank you, that's the story. Thank you. And we wanted to leave lots of time for questions, so yes. Yes, here we are. Thank you so much, Ben, for that, uh, that fascinating talk. And yes, we have plenty of time for questions. So yeah, we'll just get the table set up. And then um, what we'll do is I will take the uh, opportunity to ask you a few questions of my own first. And then we'll open it up to the audience to ask your questions and to uh, give your comments. So I want to start, actually, with essentially where you ended um, on the idea of a regulatory body, a, it's a national algorithm. Not regulatory. OK. OK. The problem already then. <laughs> um, but investigative body. Yes. Um, do you think that, so if the idea is it would be an algorithmic safety board. Do you think algorithms, or the idea of an algorithm, is actually a meaningful or tight enough group of technologies to be able to yeah. investigate with one board? Because you're talking about pulling together finance, health, infrastructure, all sorts of things. All right, there, there's a few things about the layers of abstraction. There are algorithms which sometimes you would see as a small and narrow thing. There is built into a program, built into a system, built into a complex system of systems. So we do have some real difficulties when any realistic system is combined from so many subsystems of assuring, of, of attributing responsibility. The current language uses algorithm. And so I stuck with that. The algorithmic accountability and transparency uses that language. But yes, you could say there are genuine problems in moving up to large scale systems. Still, I think decomposing systems is one of the good engineering principles. And understanding modular design is one thing that we need to strengthen more clearly so that the communication between the modules, at least we can be able to identify whether the failure is in module A, B, C, D, or beyond, the, beyond that. OK. OK. So modular design is one of the technical ways of responding to these issues. Mm -hmm. OK. And do you think that that sort of board would be accepted by whoever would be subject to it? It sounds like it would mostly be industry that's subject to it and possibly um, you know, governmental bodies if they're providing, you know, infrastructure, for It's example. a tough push, yeah. right. Uh, however, there's growing interest, sympathy among industry which understands these issues. So, for example, the partnerships in AI, five or six of the leading big companies have joined together and said, hey, we have to do something. I think our friends in this battle, and it's going to be a tough one, will be the insurance companies. The insurance companies have been strong advocates for safety in many fields, like housing, like automobiles. I think, once again, they can be advocates for safety. So it will take you know, a decade or more to begin to do these things and to build the sympathy within the computing field. And again, I repeat that the research going on here at the Alan Turing Institute and elsewhere is, is essential. We need to show that actually explainable AI is possible. DARPA 
how in the US, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency has a, a very rapid, large, in, rapidly lar rising and large project on explainable AI. We see more and more. Carlos Glestrin at University of, Was of Washington has developed some very clever ideas about how you could make explainable AI. So I think there are research questions here, and then there are the legal questions of how we transition to an environment where safety is prominent. Well, yeah, I, f I fully agree with your, your call for more research, more development of explainable uh, algorithms. I think it's something that's not only coming from the technical side, where there's a very strong interest in it, but also uh, from the regulatory and legal side as well. I noticed, uh, to, to move on to sort of a different topic, I noticed that in your uh, talk, one of the things that made it distinct from some other talks I've seen on algorithmic accountability or fairness in algorithms or transparency in algorithms is that you talk not just about unfair algorithms, but about dangerous ones or actually about right. deadly ones. And so my question is, do you think that we need a different sort of investigatory approach or different sort of controls for, say, safety-critical algorithms versus ones that have maybe more mundane or harder-to-notice harms? Absolutely, but yes. Uh, I, it also goes back to your earlier question, what about different industries? Isn't health different from education? Isn't it different from manufacturing? Yes. And there will be, as there are, building codes that are different for a private house or an apartment building or an office building or a road or other kind of structures. So, I think that will be a nuanced development that, that happens over time. And yes, I agree. You certainly, when there's life critical, uh, you're going to spend more time and effort, and the manufacturers will spend more in time and effort. But I think that's what's really necessary. Remember, we're in an age of proposing driverless cars, and the death uh, last year of a Tesla driver, uh, a non-driver, a transit, <laughs> um, was tragic, and there will be failures. I believe in driverless cars. I believe in increasing the levels of automation, but I think we need to do it with the right degrees of, of safety and protection, and when that fails, liability. My liability lawyer friends tell me no new law is needed. The existing liability law would cover these kind of environments, so we need to take that as, as the expectation society. So the transformation happens both from the industry, but from citizens, from journalists, from people who make the case here. I get very annoyed at journalists who, or maybe it's the headline writers. I'll save the journalists, but maybe there's some here. But the headline writers who turn an article about technology into saying the robots are coming, they're going to take your job, and AI triumphs again. Uh, you know, humanity has fewer places to stand. These are such misleading, counterproductive, and destructive uh, uses of language. Computers are tools with no more intelligence than a wooden pencil. We need to design them effectively to empower people. And that's where I think we have to go, especially, as your question points out, when there are life critical uses. So you mentioned the, the Tesla example. Um, and I think that raises an interesting point where uh, <coughs> HCI uh, can have a meaningful impact on making algorithms more accountable. And that <coughs> you, you talked about it a bit, about how you can actually give meaningful control at different layers or at different levels. Um, and so it seems that you could actually have an expectation that a developer gives meaningful control. For example, with uh, Tesla Autopilot, that they're not just basing their idea of control or accountability on the legal definition of, say, the driver has the ability to take control of the car, so it actually it's his responsibility for, uh, for the crash. So my question is, where do you think HCI can make a sort of meaningful impact on giving control uh, to, to the users of algorithms? Um, I, I think there's creative research possibilities for HCI, but I think we have a set of principles in place. First of all, a visual display of the world of action that I call direct manipulation, that you can see where things are going, and you can influence it in a clear way. Now, the Tesla situation is kind of interesting because in that case, um, in, in the Tesla user manual, it says, drivers have to keep their hands on the wheel at all times, okay? In fact, the state of New York is the only state requires you have two hands on the wheel at all times. It's kind of interesting. 
And so there, we may want to change the rules about what it means to be driving. Is it one hand? Do you have to have you know, one hand or two hands? And the degree of control is really important. Don Norman wrote a very nice article which talked about the user interface design for driverless cars. And he said, it's not realistic to say that the car, when it runs into trouble, will signal the operator, the driver, to, put, you know, get, to take over because they have no insufficient situation awareness to be able to do that. So we may have to build much more rigorous controls. We may have to, if you want to get driverless cars, we may need to safer highways. We have to go all the way to change the highways. Elevators, OK? We have driverless elevators, right? Pretty well, that works, because it's in a closed environment. And we can limit what happens in that environment. But getting on the road is a kind of open environment. And those are much more dangerous. So we may have to close the environment more and restrict who or what goes on the roads. We may see the first kind of driverless vehicles are, let's say, trucks or a convoy of six trucks that work from exit 7 to exit 27 on an expressway with limited access. And only cars that have the right instrumentation are allowed on there. And only you know, the, the the, 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 the roads are well marked. It's right conditions. There are fences to provi prevent animals or others. So there may be more restrictions that we have to build into the environment and, and richer sets of control. And I, I just want to repeat the other level of control is that the manufacturer needs to know of every crash or near crash so that they can monitor. And they need to make that more visible and public. I know there are trade secret issues and competitive issues. But where possible, exposing what the manufacturer knows about the problem and studying the failures is really powerful. I was very impressed in our work with the FAA of how detailed study they make of misses and near misses. Okay, That you know, these are really, really valuable data sources. And we don't have that in, in other fields. And it's something that stuck in my mind from your talk, uh, one of the many things that were very quotable or, or tweetable, we might say, is the, um, the comments about the 15-year-old mentality of, of software development. Um, and you, you talk about liability as a legal solution um, to fix that or at least to force developers to take more responsibility for their actions. I wonder on the other side, so you know, that's the, the stick, but is there a carrot that can be offered as well? I mean, we've been trying to uh, embed, say, ethical, um, ethical reflection into uh, computer science courses for decades now. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that can be done differently that's not just a legal solution, something where it's an incentivization of responsibility? I, I was really impressed, and I didn't mention it in my slides here, but in the end of last year, a wonderful report from the IEEE was published called Ethically Aligned Design. Uh, it constituted the work of more than 200 people in about 20 different subcommittees that proposed a very inspirational set of rules about ethically aligned design. So you might want to take a look at that. But I think we can raise the expectations. I, I like your question. I don't have a complete answer. Um, uh, you know, I think. There's the positive encouragement for quality. I would say the stick of insurance companies and, um, and, and government intervention in the public is probably good. But I, I would say the young people I talk to who are writing code and making these systems, they really do want to do a good job. What they want to know is, what should I do? What should I do to satisfy you know, Ben Schneiderman or to satisfy you that I've done the right job. They really want to know. So I do think it could be made uh, to be a more positive outcome. Raising the expectations, pushing for quality, I think is a worthwhile direction. OK. Um, with that, I will open it up to the audience for questions. So are there any questions? I saw right. <laughs> hand over here. Uh, gentleman in the white in front here. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. There is a microphone coming. Oh. <laughs> So um, 
So first off, thanks. Fantastic talk. Love all the topic uh, um, to bits. Um, I'm John Crowcroft. I work in the Turing Institute here. And um, the question I have is really about symmetry. So accountability is something you can hold people to. Um, um, but people have unconscious biases. And the classic example, the poster child of unaccountable uh, biasing algorithms has been the reinforcement bias of sentencing algorithms in US yeah. courts, which you gave, you know, you pointed out. Um, but of course, that, that, that propagates something that humans made an error for. But actually, we can debias the algorithm and use it to hold humans accountable. So in a symmetric world, this, this could be something that goes both directions. And a colleague of mine, uh, Christopher Miller, who's a professor of law in Queen Mary in London, has pointed out that he might actually prefer, if he does do something wrong, to be sentenced by an algorithm um, that, that checks with, you know, that the human sentencing previously isn't biased. That when we do statistics, we see uh, you know, people of color are arrested more, found guilty when they're not guilty more, and so on. So that's where the bias comes from. And people did all of that without the need of computers. So I just wonder if you think there's some way that we could think through how we play the opposite direction as we fix some of the very heinous problems we're, we're creating with automatic decision making based on machine learning and statistics, whether that couldn't be something that improves the behavior of society as a whole as well. Your, your question is very well, and you know, your point about sentencing really complements what I mentioned about granting parole, but the sentencing issue was, was widely reported, ProPublica's study of that was really an exceptional job. Uh, I would say an interesting, for the algorithms community, there's one approach here. Jerry Leskovich and John Kleinberg made a very powerful study of 750,000 um, uh, parole, uh, uh, not, not parole, this was if a person's been arrested, uh, should they be held in prison until their trial or could they be let go? Of course, there's dangers on both sides. And their analysis showed, I think, an admirable way in which algorithmic approaches could actually make it better than human side, than human judgment. But I, I would say that that's a false dichotomy. And another problem I see in this sphere of discussion, so often, so often, especially the journalists love this, is they're going to say, is it the algorithm or the human judge? One or the other, which is better? OK? And it's kind of seems like a quaint thing, you know. It's it's the race of a horse against an iron horse, you know. It's that simple-minded thinking. It's that primitive. It's never for me about an algorithm versus a person. It's always about person one using algorithm one versus person two using algorithm two. Okay. Uh, that is, you're always thinking about how to empower people using technology, okay? It's, and and the, the deceptive idea, the counterproductive idea of competition is, is pernicious. And that's why these thoughts, you know, the, the chess playing and the go playing, which pits a human against a machine, are not ways that we develop appropriate technologies. The way we develop appropriate technologies is by HCI, by studying the, what the user is doing, what are the requirements, how do we build a system that helps them perform better? And then we test them in the wild, looking at you, Yvonne Rogers, in the wild, so that we see them situated in the context of use, not in a laboratory, but get out there in the real world and see how that performs and then build on that knowledge, okay? So I think that the strategies of HCI can be put to work in very productive ways. So the, the mind shifts I describe here are often more the legal and other ones, but I, I do thank you for the question and my own you know, strong belief in building tools that enable people to perform more effectively. And, and yes, I do want to remind and say People are flawed also. The heuristics and biases communities, Kahneman, Tversky, and others have shown the, the flaws that people make in decision making. And, and, the, and the algorithms will show them more of their flaws. And if they work together with the algorithms, then we have a happier place. OK, that's where we're going. OK, another question. Just a hand right there. Uh, gentleman <laughs> in the blue, I think. Going to make her run, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Rev. Uh, I'm um, coming as a PhD student, but at the same time as a startup person. And 
uh, working with algorithms, uh, I, I can see from your lecture a, a very big threat to startup community because you are kind of equating big corporations with small companies. Uh, and I don't see the small companies having the resource to cope with the bureaucratic burdens that you are potentially putting on them. And uh, another thing, I wouldn't put the equation mark between like an algorithm behind the Angry Birds application or a smart calendar with a, with a car because both all of these products use algorithms. So my question is, have you considered those differences between companies and between the applications and the seriousness? Uh, it's really a wide subject, uh, the algorithms. And my second question whoa, is- Whoa, whoa, <laughs> let's take one at a time. Um, so yes, I understand the, the, the threat or fear for a startup or new ideas. I would say there's equally an argument that it's an opportunity for startup companies to do the things that haven't been done. I hope I point a way forward that would allow 100 startup companies to develop these ideas of explainable AI and of better controls while increasing the level of automation. As for the burden, of course, the burden would be less for smaller companies. Just as there are small builders who build a few houses a year, yet they too appear before the housing and planning commissions, and they say, here's the building I'm gonna build. Because even if you're a small company, if your application is one which has harm or damage or life critical aspects, I, I don't want that small company to be working unless they know about and follow the rules that will lead to safety. Your second question. Yeah, uh, my final question, yeah, it's about um, CE marking schemes. So uh, I work also with, uh, with automation of machines and uh, these are also things that quite uh, can affect human health and uh, well-being. Uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, the system it works very differently from a central uh, commission that uh, evaluates whether somebody is right or not. Uh, it works like uh, the, the company basically prepares its own documents according to the a simple set of rules that are available on the internet, and they don't even need to send it to any official. Uh, those, uh, those documents are only for internal use, and in case of uh, some failures or faults happening to people, so why would a commission be superior to this kind of approach, the no, I, decentralized? I agree, approach? for very standard things, you could make very standard principles online, you know, validation that you're using these modular components and therefore you should be exempt from these, you know, other rules. We, we have that in every field. Your, your concern's appropriate, uh, but I think anyone who works seriously on these forms of investigation and, and also the regulation aspects uh, is aware that you want to keep the burden light for small projects uh, that don't have wide, widespread impact. And you want to promote the idea of modular designs which are validated by others and therefore you can use them safely. Modular homes are a different story than ones that are built. And, and I think as a community, we want safe homes to be built. Right? I, know, I think we want to know that if we're buying a house that the builder has agreed to the principles of fire safety and um, uh, of construction standards that will allow it to withstand whether you're in a flood district, better protection from floods. If you're in an earthquake district, better protection from earthquakes. If you're in you know, different, different situations, require different conditions. Anyone who gets deeply into this is aware of the danger you're describing. Yes? <laughs> very kind of holding his hand up. Okay. And then we'll get down to the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Asher Rospliozzi, Brighton Business School. Nice to hear you speak again, Ben. I really enjoyed your talk, uh, and I thought the focus on what you've learned from your years of experience in HCI and visualization informed a really important end of the algorithmic safety monitoring consciousness raising. But I want to come from the other end. I teach in a business school and we think a lot there about how big businesses use access to rich data sets to make uh, increasingly profitable dis decisions, whether it's platforms like Airbnb or Uber, or let's take the example you gave of Facebook and whether we're able to understand whether or not we see our daughter's news updates. In terms of monitoring those complex decisions, I'm concerned that 
uh, an idea of human oversight goes beyond what is, what is capable of being understood. So you did say at one point, if we can't explain an algorithmic decision, don't use it. But I fear that we live in a world in which a lot of complex systems are dependent on interconnected algorithmic decisions that are beyond the range of human decision or monitoring. Uh, so a, a bit of a downer, what do you think? Yeah, I, I understand your point. I think I've mentioned before that sometimes systems get complex to be systems of systems and it's very hard to know what's happening. So one of the strategies is, is the modularity. The second technical strategy is the logging and developing the standards for logging so that when something goes bad, you can retrospectively analyze it uh, are important. I, I un understand the concerns and I, I hear that often, that this would limit the possibilities. On the other hand, I would say, um, I would say that the market itself will limit those possibilities, that people will turn away from systems which become incomprehensible or unsafe, don't do what they want, they can't predict it. Recommender systems that recommend strange things to you, suddenly I start withdrawing from them. I'm afraid to buy a product for uh, the, the, the child of a friend because then I'll get recommendations about children's books all the time. And if we could open up that recommender and I could say, hey, you know, this is a children's book, but don't give me more recommendations, you get what And I think the consumer pressure I see over the years, the constant return towards comprehensible, predictable, and controllable. One, one story is, for example, bank teller machines. The early machines had the AI logo or notions of Tilly the Teller, Harvey Wallbanker, Bob the Bank of Baltimore, and other kind of anthropomorphic characters. This was the dream of 30 years ago. Even Apple's 1987 famous film of the Knowledge Navigator had a bow-tied young butler and the idea of that there would be a friend, it would be a partner. Well, those are all gone. Those are all gone. They don't survive the marketplace, okay? Now, all the bank machines have gone towards the service it provides to the customer, okay? And I get my 20 pounds quickly enough. That's the service, the comprehensible, predictable, controllable. I know what I get out of this machine. I don't want a conversation. I don't want to chit-chat, and I want to know what I'm going to get. So I think... That happens. Now, I'm not prepared to wait this long distance. I think we can learn from the history of those misguided designs, and, and I hope companies will take that message more and more clearly. In, in fact, the name for bank teller machines has gone from automatic teller machines, ATMs, they're now called advanced transaction machines. The names are really important, the misleading names. Unmanned aerial vehicles. Okay, drones, and so those words are not helpful, okay? In fact, the US Air Force calls them remotely piloted vehicles. Again, asserting responsibility that there is a human operating. It's not just human in the loop, but human owns the loop, okay? And that, I believe, the future of technology will go more and more towards the direction of powerful tools, not smart, intelligent, and so on. So, I, I, I'm hopeful that there's a positive. If I can help raise consciousness of people to be aware of the dangers of these poorly designed systems, we'll get to the better designed systems more rapidly. Thank you, Esther. And then, uh, here we go. Here in the front. I saw a quiet, persistent uh, hand being raised over here. So it's your turn now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm a human factor specialist from uh, air, in air traffic control. Um, and there seems to be a bit of a, a conflict, I think, in what you're saying, in terms of you're fully supportive of fully uh, unmanned or driverless cars, but we're emphasizing tools. So is it reasonable for us to expect drivers to be monitoring uh, driverless cars and having both hands on the steering wheel, is that, is that a reasonable thing to be asking drivers to do? 
So that, was there, are you making some connection with air traffic control? Well, it's because in, in air traffic control, I, have, I am trying to persuade a lot of people that we won't get to that point. Yeah. We won't get to the point where you just have an air traffic controller watching a system because it's not reasonable. Right, right. And if, 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 the, if the algorithms are that complex that it's able to take into account all the things that the humans are doing, you'll end up emulating human error rather than getting rid of it. Uh, just, just one comment about the aviation. The reason we get on planes is because we know there are two pilots sitting up front. If they weren't sitting up front, I don't think I'd get on that plane. OK, and I don't think you would either, right? Right. OK, so if we come back to cars, cars, I suggested that cars, I do see some opportunities for, and I think it'll take longer than the advocates believe, for us to get towards some uses of driverless cars. I think we have uh, driverless trains in many airports. Those little shuttle trains run back and forth, and they do so quite reliably. They're monitored from a central place, but we don't really need an operator because those trains are in a closed situation where most things are predictable, and there are very few errors that I know of in that kind of transportation. So I was suggesting that I would like to see, by the way, driverless cars on the Google campus, right? Let them put up a driverless car that shuttles people from one building to another, or the Microsoft campus. It's a large enough area that you need transportation to get around. They actually now have buses that drive people from one facility to another. But if they believe in it, then let them try it in that environment. And they will find, I think, that if you can control and limit the way that pedestrians get in the way, the way that cats and dogs run across, the way that trees fall, the way you know the, its use on a rainy or snowy day, I think they'll learn a lot about how to do it. I suggested also the controlled environment of an interstate highway in the US where you have limited access. You control which cars get on. You don't just have anybody any wild motorcycle driver getting on, only those that have the right instrumentation and are controlled, and then you can have a more reliable service. Is that? Well, it's how do we persuade people that that's the future rather than the fully automated, or if we've got to wait to let them it, see that's... Tough. So I think Google made a t disturbing mistake in showing a, a car which had no driver wheel at all, and the suggestion of, you know, that this was coming soon. I don't think we'll see that. I, I do like the features you know, that are being added to automate cars to stop if there's a, you know obstruction in the way to automatically park. There's a number of small things that are growing to be ever larger. I like that process of where it goes. And I note, by the way, that Toyota broke from the others. And its approach to driverless car was always increasing the performance of the, of the operator, not eliminating. So we'll see how this sorts out. We could take some bets here today about how many cars will be automated in 10 years and, and see how far we get with that. But I'm, I, I would say a more cautious approach will emerge as they, as they take, this, take on the realities of dealing with it. Ernest, right over here. <laughs> right here. <laughs> right there. <laughs> get the last question. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for a wonderful talk, a very in inspirational talk, and great answers to the questions so far. Um, <laughs> but here's now, one. I just want a great answer to my question. <laughs> Actually, I think my question is only to try to make explicit something that you probably intended. But when you talk about independent oversight of algorithms, which is the thrust of your talk, I'm concerned that my friends in software engineering might misinterpret that as meaning making sure that algorithms do what they're meant to do. Whereas half the problem is making sure that what they're meant to do is also yeah. <laughs> importantly correct. Yeah. And so the independent oversight has to be over what they're meant to do as well as whether they do. Yeah, what I hope that gets addressed when I put the upstream planning oversight. First, you say what you're going to do, OK? And then you get permission to do that. If you're going to build a house that is in inadequate support for a three-story building, you should be prevented from doing that, OK? 
and the community standards will arise. If you want to come back and say, well, I've got a really special way of supporting a three-story building, and I've got super strong structural underneath, well, okay, we now get exemptions. So every kind of rule has an enforcement process, okay? It has an exemptions process. It has an enhancements process that changes over time, and it has an education process. That's I call the four E's of any of these kind of processes. I'll just repeat them that you have exemptions, you have you know, enforcement first, excuse me, enforcement, exemptions, enhancements, and education. And I think that's what it takes to put any regime in order. Uh, so I agree with your point is that, and it's the design thinking you're, that I expect from you, Ernest, going upstream to question the goals that people might have. And I think that's, that's going to be part of the process. OK, and the final question. Here we are. Hi, Ben. Uh, Philip Sheldrake. I'm a member of a cooperative called the Digital Life Collective at diglife.com. And we exist to nurture technology we can trust. And so your topic today is most apt. I wonder if you could comment on two questions about this subject that we're grappling with. The first is on the question of transparency, algorithmic transparency. Some algorithms don't work when they're made transparent. Uh, we like to call them nocturnal because they only work in the dark. Uh, a very easy <laughs> example is PageRank, for example. As soon as you explain to people how it works, it can be gamed and therefore becomes entirely redundant. And the other topic we're grappling with is the system of systems, as you've just described here. One could imagine half a dozen algorithms at the systems level that have no liability coming their way whatsoever. They work purely as intended, to the last questioner's point. But you can imagine in a complex adaptive system, six great algorithms interacting in deleterious ways. Who then should be liable? OK, let's see. Uh, just <laughs> Backtrack to the first one about the nocturnal AIs. <laughs> Sorry, nocturnal algorithms. algorithms. Yeah. But I, um, you stated uh, an important issue, but I think you stated it too strongly. We sort of know what the page rank algorithm is. Of course, Google has a thousand little variations that they've tuned it on over time to try to limit the damage and improve the, the qualities. Um, so I'm not sure that it's totally nocturnal. I don't quite get it. I mean, I. We can study it because we may not know it's functioning, but we can test its performance under different streams of input and see what the output is. So I'm not sure it's, it's as extreme as you say. It's not so black. It's not so nocturnal. It's not so hidden. Um, and its basic understanding of you know, eigenvec eigenvector centrality you know, is a good idea, well established in graph theoretic literature. Uh, but there, there are thousands of variations um, are, are an issue. Your other one is of large, complex systems of modules put together. Well, doesn't a you know Boeing 787 or Airbus 380 also constitute systems of systems? Uh, under the domain of one organization, but in a societal complex, where there are different organizations, algorithms interplaying, then there could be emergent behavior that was unexpected from any of the contributory algorithmic players. Well, I mean, and that also is sort of trying to escape the liability responsibility. It's, you know, it's not mine, he did it. Or the computer did it, the general thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with those kind of situations. The reason we fly on Airbus and Boeing planes is because somebody does take reliability. If somebody said, hey, I've got an open sourced airplane, and we're going to open source, and all these components will be built together, we'll be a lot cheaper. It's going to, you know, everybody will contribute. We'll be updated continuously. I don't think I'm flying open source air flights. You know, I think that those things are going to be interesting. Maybe they'll bring some novelty. But I don't think they're the place for life critical or, or damaging systems. Okay, and I would say, on the other hand, you know what what Kathy O'Neill is pointing to is the um, excessive centrality. There's a danger there where one company makes an algorithm that everybody uses for credit ranking. There's no alternative to way of challenging it. 
We don't know what it is, so I think those are, those are dangerous. So you're, you're describing a valid issue about the range of complexity, total centrality, some kind of mixed modules from different sources, but there is a integrator, there is a systems engineering process, and then we have this extreme open source idea where we open source, but I'm afraid I'm not quite ready, unless they've had some validation, and unless they put out a pretty big bond that uh, covers any liability. You want to respond, did I see you? I, I guess uh, I'm just thinking in terms of the smart cities in particular, because it's something I'm personally familiar with and involves many different players, as we would hope if we were looking for a heterogeneous environment as opposed to some kind of, I don't know, Microsoft City or Google City. <laughs> and so as soon as you have many different private sector players participating in automating the city, the city could evolve behaviors that you can't point the finger at one player and say it's your fault. I think I'm going to stand my ground in saying I, uh, I, I would really hope that uh, you know, there become sources of responsibility and liability that somebody takes it on. I think those things are more likely to prove acceptable and effective. Um, there, there has to be, I think, as I said, you know, uh, clarifying responsibility accelerates quality. I think that's kind of a shorthand way of saying it, that it really is a powerful force. And I do want people who propose and put out systems to be a little more than ad hoc. I want them to be focused, and I want there to be a, a desk where I can complain. I have real trouble with companies that have no customer service desk I can go to to ask a question or to complain. I believe that clarifying responsibility accelerates quality. That's probably the Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so yes, thank you all right. for your answers. Thank, thank you, you thank much. you all.